hopefully scenes belonging firmly in the past, an iconic Manchester venue at the heart of the battle against Covid. Now back to its familiar role as a home for politics. If a year is an eternity in a pandemic, then all you need in normal politics is a week. Seven days ago and the initial government response to shortages at the pumps, it's an immediate problem with a simple solution. The cause of these current problems is that um, panic buying episode. Uh, and the most important thing is for people to start uh, you know, buying petrol as they normally would. A Prime Minister on the move and a change of tune firmly entrenched. Opportunities from Brexit will increase driver wages. A remodelling of the economy that might take time to produce results. I was proud to back Brexit, proud to back Leave. And who better than the first Brexit supporting Chancellor to serve notice? Be patient. Brexit was never just about the things we couldn't do. It was also about the things we didn't do. My point is this. Even if you can't see it yet, I assure you, the future is here. Row upon row of beds filled this space when it served as a Nightingale hospital at the height of the pandemic. All gone now, thankfully, to be replaced by a return to old ways and the sign of a government seeking to show how a crisis at the pumps can serve as an opportunity. Great, one leading Brexiteer told me, as the government talks about how higher wages are the answer. Pity there wasn't much of a strategy, this MP moaned, talking about how the government appears to have stumbled into one. Nadim Zahawi. How are you? Cabinet Brexiteers are echoing the message. There is change and it will take time. But are we seeing more openness that, yes, there will be opportunities, but it will take time? For example, the fuel shortages. It's going to be an issue of dealing with wages, not just going for sort of cheap immigration. So, so let me try and bring it to life for you. What I think is beginning to happen, and because I was business and industry minister in Bayes um, and then took on the vaccine role and, of course, now in education, you're already being, beginning to see a transformation of a number of sectors. What Boris is signalling, rightly so, is to say, look, you, know, you need to think about how you invest in your business. There's no longer a pool of cheap labour, right? And when that is no longer there, your CFO suddenly says, actually, you know what? the investment in technology and upskilling is worth it. So let's do it. And that's the transition we're seeing. So transition with some pain along the No, way. I think with lots of gain. Of course, it doesn't turn overnight. Uh, you know, in the same way that it takes seven years to create a doctor, it will take a number of years to create a nuclear engineer and a number of years for a factory to be at full uh, pelt making uh, wind turbine blades. So all of these take time, but I think there is a real sense of excitement in the government and the Prime Minister is leading on all those things that the UK can now do now that we are free of those EU frameworks. A former Remainer who switched sides under the influence of his son sees upsides. Okay, the position the Prime Minister took was very good because he's basically saying the pluses here are yes there may be shortages of some of the drivers, some of the low paid workers, some of the Eastern Europeans quote unquote no prejudice intended don't come. But what is the upside? The upside is that British workers will be getting high paid jobs and of course there's a huge challenge now to make sure it can't be that difficult to drive a heavy goods vehicle. I, I mean, I don't tell me they're not up to it. I mean, I, I, I drive tractors and stuff like that. But it's quite a gamble, isn't it? Because it may not work or it does work. And what do increased wages mean? They mean inflation. Not necessarily. Inflation is a function of supply and demand. That is the issue. And if supply is there, there won't be inflation. Winding down and pausing for reflection. The normal rhythm of a conference in a once extraordinary location. Nick, what there? So will this shortage of supplies and workers now felt across many industries really lead to a better economy? The logic says that if demand is higher, wages go up. But businesses are wondering where that money will come from. And if the higher costs are passed on to the consumer, then is the economy actually growing at all? Here's Seema Katecha with the numbers. It's conference season and there are lots of things being said by politicians in speeches and in interviews. But here on Newsnight, we're going to tell you some of what's fact and what's not. Starting with wages. Here's what the Chancellor said earlier. Wages are rising and that is, that is a good thing. That's a positive thing. We, you know, we want to see that. That is the best protection against 
cost of living challenges for families if their wages are rising. Of course, wages fell at the beginning of the pandemic because people worked fewer hours or went on furlough, where the government paid 80% of their wages and then later 60%. Take a look at this graph. You can see wages increasing last autumn into this year as more people returned to work. But the average earning figures we're seeing now are being compared to those at the height of the pandemic in 2020, making that annual increase in wages look misleadingly a lot bigger. Now, another factor that has driven up average earnings is the impact of the pandemic on low paid workers. More of them have lost their jobs over the last 18 months, having more people in higher paid jobs pushes up the average earnings figure. The state of the labour market is complex, which makes it difficult to work out exactly what the real trends are. Ministers decided to suspend the pensions triple lock this year because of those challenges. Even the government said the figures were skewed and distorted because of that complex backdrop. ONS data shows in the three months to this July, Average weekly real wages, which take into account inflation, fell from £491 in April to £488 in July. Some analysts say some data does point to strong wage growth at 6% for the year. But overall, if you look at what's actually happening to most workers, wage growth is probably nearer half that, say 3-4%. And obviously inflation is now creeping up. It's at 3%. It's expected to get to 4% by the end of the year. So big picture in terms of what's happening to wages, they're broadly flat with prices rising as well as wages increasing. Now, over the weekend, Boris Johnson made this statement. What you've got at the moment is a shortage of lorry drivers, shortage of truck drivers that's affecting the whole world. There's even a shortage of truck drivers in China. There's a shortage in, there's a shortage in America and, uh, and in Poland. Poland has a shortage of around 120,000 drivers, compared with the British shortfall of around 100,000. But there's been no significant disruption to their supply chains. Industry experts tell us its access to the single market means drivers from neighbouring countries can easily come over to help with their logistics. Britain now has a smaller pool of drivers because of tighter immigration controls after Brexit, while reform to tax legislation has drastically reduced incomes for agency workers. Tens of thousands of HEV driving tests were cancelled last year due to the pandemic, exacerbating an existing shortage. Australia and Central Asia have reported HEV driver shortages of 20% due to a surge in demand for goods during the pandemic. Logistics experts say the only place that doesn't have a significant shortage of drivers is Africa. However, nowhere else apart from here are we seeing queues outside petrol stations raising questions as to what happened here that didn't happen elsewhere. Seema Kotecha, well, joining us now is Lucy Fraser, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, nice of you to join us, uh, Lucy. And your boss this morning kept talking about this global supply issue, yet we're the only country with soldiers driving HGVs and petrol pumps closed for business because they've run dry. Well, you're right to say, as the Chancellor was right to say, this is a global issue and the reason it's a global issue is because we had very slow uh, a very slow economy during the uh, pandemic and um, a number of businesses were shut and now what we see uh, when the economy has opened again is a significant forgive uh, me for coming in, but i actually said effect. the opposite which is that many countries are facing the same issues but no other country is facing these shortages where we're seeing the army driving hgv trucks and petrol stations closed because they've run out. Yeah, Emily, if you could just let me finish. I think we were saying the same thing. So there are global issues. And uh, what is happening here is there is sufficient supply of petrol um, and uh, in the refineries, but it's not spread across the country. That's why You've we're seeing the, the pictures. army driving trucks. That's why we've seen the pictures in the paper of people queuing. And I understand the frustration of those people who are queuing. But there, there is sufficient supply in the country. It's about where do you get it Lucy, from? But you, know, so it's not just, you well, know it's not just fuel. You know it's the farmers who are at the end of their tether because 
they will lose a whole year's worth of livestock having to cull pigs because there aren't enough butchers to come in. You know it's affecting the harvest of daffodils is the next one. 270 million daffodil stems left unharvested because they can't get the seasonal workers to do that. These are all businesses and industries. We could go on and talk about hospitality. We could go on and talk about the care homes. It's not just one sector. It's not just fuel. Well, I'd like to come to the detail of some of the things you've made, because there are answers to be made on the detail. But the broad issue is there are issues globally, and we, the government, are taking several measures uh, to, to tackle that. Yeah. I mean, just to pick up on a couple of things you said, because I wouldn't want the public to not understand the entire position. So, so you mentioned um, pig, pig farming uh, uh, and, uh, and butchers, as has been uh, talked about in that context. Um, so, in fact, butchers is a skilled uh, profession that is, that is on the list uh, and people can come here. So that isn't an issue. It isn't an issue about people not coming here. So just, just can, explain can then. You no, know, no, I'm really interested in that because we know that from the Times front page, I don't know if we can bring it up, that there are offers of visas for some sectors, HGV uh, being one and you say pig farms being uh, the other. Only 27 visas have been applied for from EU workers. Why so that tells you that... something, doesn't it? It that does. That tells you that that isn't necessarily the answer. The answer is, and this is what well, the Chancellor was the, talking... The six months... If I could just finish. The six months What the Chancellor the was talking about today is that, and what the Prime Minister has said on many, many occasions is, the answer isn't to have uncontrolled immigration coming into this, why is that into this country Sorry, why is that to allow uh, low wages, which we've had over the course of a number of years. The answer is to ensure that we skill up uh, the people that we have in this country, we've got a million vacancies. Uh, we need to ensure that the vacancies match the skills. Mm. And that is what the Chancellor's uh, speech today was all about, making sure that we provide jobs for people in this country. Uh, Amory Trevelyan was talking about that the length of time that will be needed. She used the example of a doctor that could take seven years to skill up. So I guess that the simple question that, that the public would ask you is how long do they have to wait for this new economy to take shape? How much pain will they have to see before that happens? It's already starting. So uh, the Chancellor outlined the extension of a number of schemes which are already uh, in operation. So he talked, for example, about the kickstart scheme. Sorry, Young just not, people, not to talk about the if schemes. If I could just finish, if, if I could. Just if, let's get back the I question. Just just, it's about the pain. How long will people have to sit out the pain Whatever that is, whether it's in hospitality, whether it's in care homes, whether it's in trying to get fuel, whether it's in seeing a rise in their food prices, which we know are going up because of shortages, how long should they sit out that pain for? Well, if, if, I, if I could just answer the yeah. question, um, a number of um, schemes have already been opera in operation, which are enabling people to get into the jobs uh, that are needed. So the Kickstart scheme, as I mentioned, 60, 75 people or 75,000 people already on that scheme. Uh, that's young people uh, getting into work. But it's not just about that. It's about training people. Mm. There are short term boot camps enabling people to get into the skilled jobs that they need. Because you'll, you'll have heard from businesses already and they're saying when there's a shortage, when demand um, goes up, then, then we are expected to pay drivers or whatever more money. Where does that money come from? I mean, do, do businesses pay out of their pocket and then claim it back from the consumer? Because if so, that's not growing the economy. That's, that's not. So you're absolutely right. That not, is not the answer. The answer is twofold. The answer is uh, to give people jobs, high mm. skill jobs, um, so that uh, businesses can be more uh, can can increase their productivity. So if we get good people uh, doing better skilled jobs, uh, companies will be more efficient. Right. Uh, and it's also about increasing productivity through technology. So the Chancellor talked today about AI um, and uh, increasing innovation and technology mm. to make businesses more competitive. And in those circumstances, you don't get business, uh, costs passed on to the consumer. Actually, you get more productive companies uh, producing right. things possibly at Lucy, the same that's or a lower really, price. It's a really honest answer to that because what you're essentially saying is wait for a technological revolution wait for people to be skilled wait for people to finish their however many years of well, apprenticeship I mean, but, but, Emily, but it comes back things... to the consumer now if I'm a consumer now and I'm wondering what my Christmas dinner might cost me or whether I'll get the ingredients for it or whether the shortages 
will last as they are doing for months to come. You're not saying, no, 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 we've sorted this out. We've, we've got a, a pragmatic, you know, the Chancellor said he was a, a pragmatist, not an ideologue. You're not saying we've got that sorted. You're saying wait, wait for the technological revolution and the economy to turn around, right? There are some things that will take time, and you heard Anne-Marie say there are some things that will take time, and there are some things that we can do and that we are doing uh, right now. Mm. So one of those things is boot camps mm. in relation to training up skills for people, HGV drivers, uh, people in the construction industry. Um, you, you've talked about agriculture. You know, We already have 30,000 people on a seasonal agricultural workers scheme who can come in into this country. Uh, we've already taken a, a large number of measures in a, in a number of sectors and there is already a cabinet so committee what are we going to do about who that? is looking at um, the issues that you raise. What, what are we going to do about that um, that Times front page story then? If only 27 people have applied from the EU to drive HGV fuel trucks, that suggests something's wrong. We're not going to keep the army on, on the roads driving our trucks for this long. So is it that they don't find the visas attractive enough because they're simply not long enough? and they don't get any health care whilst they're here and it's in the run-up to Christmas and why should they leave on New Year's Eve or whatever? I mean, are you going to start rethinking that or do you say, oh, well, 27's fine, nobody else wants the job? The government was always very clear that increasing the number of people who could come into this country was only one of a number of measures that they were putting in place in order to ensure that we had sufficient lorry drivers, HGV drivers. Uh, another measure is increasing the training of our uh, our current drivers um, who want to get those skills and uh, the long-term plan is to in, in, improve the training so that we can get 50,000 additional people uh, through the training. Mm. Um, uh, further measures are expanding um, the licenses of those, who's, um, who, those drivers whose licenses are about to expire. So yes, yes, it is possible um, to get people from Europe. Um, but there are other measures that we're already putting in place to help British drivers okay. here. Lucy Fraser, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for coming in.